thank you all for tuning in today. Um, today's webinar is, is definitely one of my more favorite subjects to talk about, and so I hope you all enjoy it as much as I do. Um, today we're going to cover patch burning and grazing, and furthermore we're going to talk about the nuts and the bolts of patch burning, and discuss not only why it works, but how to do it, and how to do it successfully. Um, today's webinar is a superstar mix of range expertise. We've got Dr. Bob Lyons sharing some of his patch burn grazing work that um, he collaborated on, or him and Dr. Megan Clayton worked on together um, on recently conducted research in South Texas. So we're not only going to, to show you why it works, or, but also give you a little bit of insight as to the research being con currently conducted on it. So I'm going to start things off today, uh, today's webinar, um, and really get into to why patch burning works. Um, before we start to understand how a certain management strategy works or how to successfully create a patch burn mosaic, I believe it's very important to have a basic understanding of the mechanisms driving this response, and that's particularly the grass response to prescribed burning. Um, and so just as a side note, for future reference in this presentation, when I mention fire, I'm specifically talking about a prescribed burn and not a wildfire situation. Um, it's very important that we make that distinction right off the bat since those are very or two very different kinds and types of fire. Um, so after we talk about the general grass response to burning, we are going to get into the mechanics of how it works, um, which is by altering plant competition. Um, to maintain overall plant community diversity and resilience. And then afterwards, Dr. Lyons is going to share some new patch burn research utilizing GPS collars. So grasses have the ability to basically die down to the underground organs, and that's what sustains that particular grass species throughout the dormant season or when we have above ground disturbances. Um, and this typically exposes the above ground vegetation. Um, and basically their growing po points or carbohydrate reserves, which are their basal meristems, are beneath the soil surface. So this protects grasses from drought, um, but also from fire. And fires in grasslands move very, very fast, typically only lasting two to two and a half minutes. Um, and although the soil temperature during a fire can be extremely hot, um, up to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit or greater, soil is a very good insulator um, and also permits them to regrow after intensive grazing. So these basal meristems that we're talking about is basically undifferent undifferentiated tissue or meristematic cells found in zones of the plant where growth can take place. It's the foundation or the building block for new grass growth. Um, so when we say basal, we're talking in the base of that grass and not in the tips or, or, or the shoots, not in the above ground tillers of, of those plants. And warm season grasses um, are actually one of the three photosynthetic mechanisms that exist to fix carbon. And these grasses are much more efficient at fixing carbon and as a result are also better adapted to hot and dry conditions characteristic to drought or even recently burned areas. So this brings us to our first question. When we're talking about basal meristems or these vegetative buds that are capable of forming new grass growth, um, how many of these buds exist on a single tiller of a native perennial grass like blue grandma? So we've got several choices here. A would be two buds per tiller. Uh, B would be four. C is zero, and D is eight. We'll give you guys a minute to make your selections. It looks like a lot of you are leaning towards eight buds, but then we've got some thinking it's, it's um, only two buds per tiller. And 5% of you say zero.
Okay, so the correct answer for this question, how many basal meristems exist on a single tiller of native perennial grass like Blue Grandma? And the answer is actually D, eight buds. We could probably put a range of buds on that from eight to 10, and that's typically what we see on a native perennial grass like Blue Grandma. Um, and these are, these are buds on a single tiller, and these are buds at the base, so typically located just below the soil surface. And this is just one example of an adaptive mechanism that exists on our native perennial grasses um, against above ground disturbances like grazing, drought, and fire. So these buds are very well protected and capable of re-sprouting and activating actually within 24 hours of being burned. And that's what we, what those vegetative buds look like. That's under a really high definition microscope. Okay, but what happens when we do such a good job with the management of our pastures and minimize, if not eliminate, grazing and fire altogether? A lot of folks out there think that um, above ground disturbances like grazing and fire are, are bad or are very negative. And these types of, situa <laughs> types of situations typically make me laugh because oftentimes managers can become so overprotective of their grass that they fail to see the utility and the function associated with Mother Nature's naturally occurring processes like fire and, and grazing. So oftentimes when I see this picture or show this picture, folks think that this is a very pristine grassland, that we've got the right species um, in, this, in this picture. Um, and, and actually, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's although very probably um, very desirable in the production and in the species that you have in this picture, but it's, it's a monoculture of a very desirable native perennial grass. So, so it becomes very confusing to folks as, as to what type of balance we should be managing for when we're dealing with those above ground disturbances like fire and grazing. So when we take a closer look at that picture or at that monoculture of, of the native perennial grass that we saw, we see that there are, there are several issues with this picture. Okay, so number one, it's all the same thing. I mentioned monoculture in the previous, in the previous slide, and, and that's basically what this, what this picture is illustrating. So research shows that increased plant diversity actually increases the ability or the overall ability for a plant community to positively respond to those above ground disturbances like fire, grazing, drought, and even climate change. Um, so the more diverse a plant community is, the better for both a plant's perspective and even a grazing livestock perspective too. So another reason um, that that a lack of diversity can be very problematic is that a strong bunch grass like little blue stem puts off a lot of litter and old dead crap basically that nobody likes to eat. So nobody likes to eat it, nobody likes to walk through it, and nobody likes to use it like grassland birds. So decreased forage quality, palatability and have, have major implications um, for not only grazing livestock um, production, but also for wildlife habitat. Okay, another issue with something like this where there's very minimal diversity or minimal disturbance is that we have altered soil moisture conditions. So all of this litter that we see on this, on this picture is preventing precipitation from actually infiltrating the soil profile. So although we are receiving rainfall and water is being captured, right, it's laying in that litter layer, it is not being used for our desirable grasses and will likely uh, be later lost in evaporation. And all of this slowly starts to combine to alter that overall plant community and we can eventually start to see some successional changes take place from a grassland eventually transitioning into more of a shrubland. So we, knew we do need above ground disturbances like fire and grazing to maintain a grassland open type of plant community that many uh, livestock and wildlife species benefit from. So pristine grasslands isn't one type of grass or one kind of flower or forb, it's hundreds of them. And the variety 
does more than just look pretty or add to the aesthetic value of the land. It, in, it actually ensures against, um, it, it actually protects the land. So in some hot weather, we see some species wilt where others flourish. And when insects and disease strike, we see some species suffer and others thrive. So it's, it's been said that grasslands tolerated adversity through diversity. So diversity is very, very important. So grazing and browsing are natural ways to decrease the chances of catastrophic um, wildfire. But from these historical fire and grazing patterns, we know that animal, animals preferentially select burned areas and graze them heavily. So when another area was burned, they typically shift their utilization to new patches, OK? So and if we think about this from a historical perspective, there was a natural cycle of fire and grazing with the way the buffalo roamed throughout the Great Plains. Um, in fact, Native Americans were the first ones to implement prescribed burns to attract grazing bison. And the Plains Indians sometimes refer, actually referred to fire as the red buffalo. So this picture that we see here is of a buffalo wallow in the southern Great Plains. And fire was so important and, and so much a part of that system and, and, and such a, a good disturbance for the, for the plant communities there. Um, and in the overall maintenance of grasslands, that that one of the Native American tribes from the Northern Plains actually used the same word for both prairie and fire. They were synonymous. You couldn't have one without the other. So with fire occurring first and great and grazing bison following fire um, as a second natural above ground disturbance, a naturally occurring patchy mosaic high in species diversity was actually created. So from historical fire and grazing patterns, um, we know that animals preferentially select burned areas and graze them heavily. When another area was burned, they typically shift their utilization to this new patch. And this allows the previously burned and closely grazed patch to rest until adequate fuel has grown back, which then allows the next fire event to occur. And this fire grazing interaction would create a shifting mosaic over the entire landscape that was very critical to the conservation of biodiversity. So this isn't the first time that we have talked about fire and grazing. However, traditional approaches to grazing typically revolve around uniform utilization of a pasture. And if we start talking about the typical use of fire, if a land manager does decide to use fire, it is normally implemented with deferment of grazing before and after the fire. So rare, very rarely are these two ecosystem drivers um, used together as they occurred historically on native prairies. Until now, right? So what is patch burning? Patch burning is the purposeful grazing of a section of a landscape or pasture that has been prescribed burn and then another and then burning another section to move the grazing pressure, shifting, creating a shifting mosaic on the landscape or pasture. So with patch burning grazing, we are truly mimicking historical grazing preferences and patterns. And although this is a very simplistic version of what it used to be, um, patch burn grazing is basically grazing promoted through the use of fire. So patch burn grazing allows livestock to freely select the most recently burned part of a unit or pasture. And livestock typically spend a majority of their time on these pastures and then and thereby utilizing all the palatable plants within this entire burned patch. Or uh, most oftentimes we can see them use what previously was very unpalatable or, or uh, not preferred and fire can promote the grazing of those typically unpreferred plants. 
So after we burn a certain area, within six to 12 months, we would burn another portion of that unit and shift the focal grazing point to the new burn patch. After the heavy utilization one year post burn, a transition state of, of bare ground, forbs, and low amounts of standing biomass and litter starts to occur. So we start to see that particular site start to recover. And within two to three years post burn, the patch receives very little grazing pressure, which allows more biomass and litter to accumulate. And then this patch is then ready to be burned and grazed again. So this is all accomplished without fences or other management input besides the use of prescribed fire. And through this system, we maintain heterogeneity of varying degrees of time since fire, and we are able to increase plant diversity. Okay, so brings us to our second question. How much time do cattle actually spend on those recently burned areas? We've got some choices of A, 25%, B, 40%, C, no time at all, and D, 75%. We'll give you guys some time to vote. Looks like a majority of you are cluing in on, on what I said earlier. And that answer is, uh, it's D. It's 75% of their time is spent on recently burned areas. And this picture shown here is, is actually, when I say recent, we still were putting fire on the ground when these heifers started getting onto that uh, freshly burned prickly pear. And this is um, just outside of San Angelo at our Barnhart Research Station. So why is this type of management so important? Managing for biodiversity and plant community resilience increases the overall function and integrity of plant communities. Okay. And this is accomplished by maximizing species diversity and ecological resilience. Resilience is, is basically the ability to bounce back. So if we can maintain the ability for our landscapes to respond to drought, grazing, and fire, then these types of disturbances that definitely will occur, okay, it's not a matter of if, but when, they won't be so devastating because we have managed for those, dis for those types of disturbances all along. So first creating the shifting mosaic of habitat and then shifting that location to provide the rest and recovery that first patch needs is very, is crucial to the overall success of that patch burn. If we create first and then shift the pressure, we are providing the full range of vegetation structure to meet wildlife and livestock needs. And more importantly, we are avoiding repetition. We're giving them more selection by burning more units or more sections of that pasture. And, and, and plants are not, are not being overgrazed, um, which is typically what you, what you might see in a traditional, um, prescribed burn post-grazing scenario. Okay, but as any good range ecologist would say, it all depends, right? The scale and the interspersion of those patches are very important and are indicative to the overall goals and management objectives. So we have two very, very different choices here. Uh, the one on the left would probably is probably managed at a larger scale, while the one on the right is uh, definitely more finer scaled, which would probably require more management. But the scale at, at which you implement this is all dependent upon your objectives. So there's a lot of freedom in how you implement uh, the patch burn grazing strategy. So there is no silver bullet answer, but implementing that initial burn and subsequent burns to shift that pressure off of the recently burned areas are key. And this model, conceptual model, is basically how I would break a pasture down for patch burn grazing. Um, and this, this just gives you kind of an idea of, of how to think about things. So if we have a pasture boundary here, 
Um, the cool thing about all of this is that edge effect that we create. And with that edge effect, it actually is providing a natural barrier to wildfire um, by reducing those fuel loads in certain areas of the pasture. So if a wildfire does occur in this pasture, you've got several anchor points um, with reduced fuel loads. So I've mentioned wildlife species um, also prefer differences in, um, in prescribed burning and differences in, in their habitat requirements. Um, but the question that I have is, is how much differences are, are, or how much difference do they typically require? So for example, the lesser prairie chicken, uh, recently just put on that endangered species list, has a has a huge variety of habitat requirements um, for their diff different um, nesting or foraging requirements. So anything from lightly to ungrazed uh, to minimal types of disturbances. And then for their lecking grounds, they require substantial types of disturbance. And we can create that through that fire grazing um, interaction. Okay, so what do I mean when I say vegetation structure, habitat conditions, and vegetation structure? Um, these examples uh, can include tall, dense vegetation, uniformly short vegetation, okay, Maybe some areas where tall forbs exist, but with the short grass, it's easier for smaller wildlife to walk through. So short grass and tall forbs for cover. Um, and then we even have medium height or density that is usually achieved um, maybe with responsible grazing in a rest rotation type system with very light to moderate stocking rates. So all of these are examples of those differences in vegetation structure. And that structure can even occur in those patchy areas that we talked about. So we can meet those two keys by altering the stocking rate and season of grazing between those years. And being flexible when it comes to those target species, uh, which may require complete rest, or just the opposite, heavy utilization is, is very important. So flexibility and adaptability um, are also keys to creating that shifting mosaic of habitat patch, uh, patches. But incorporating the right grazing decision regarding stocking rate post-fire is just as important as those actual prescribed burn prescriptions. For example, if we are in a productive year but have a light stocking rate, like the example we see on top, we haven't created much of a difference in that overall vegetation structure regardless of the time since fire. So it's important that we match our patch burn grazing objectives to adequately meet the growing conditions that each plant requires. And each plant, uh, so when we're talking about that diversity of plants, different categories can exist, okay? But it's, it's very important to understand that each plant has that unique set of growing conditions as it relates to light, moisture, and nutrients. And manipulating that plant competition with both fire and grazing needs to periodically provide each species with what it needs based on those management objectives. Okay, so when we talk about the diversity of plants, those different categories exist. When implementing the, the patch burn grazing model, it's important to manage for all of these categories regardless of their importance due to the prioritization of plant community diversity. So for example, colonizers serve a very important purpose in soil stability, um, preventing erosion, following reclamation type of restoration treatments. Whereas occupiers, for example, maintain that stability after the, sites, the site begins to recover through varying degrees of different successional stages.
So in order to maintain that diversity, we constantly need to be manipulating the competitive advantages that, that each plant category offers. So for example, here we have a grassland dominated by perennial grasses. Um, and this would be characteristic of a rangeland managed with very little diversity as, as an objective. Okay, so this, this picture would relate back to that first photograph I showed that is being managed uh, for little to no plant diversity. So there is very little root space or available light for new plant establishment. And this is a, con this slowly starts to become a continuous cycle of a monoculture type of setting, like what we would maybe see with Tanglehead or even Purple Threon, with very little plant diversity. Well, let's say all of a sudden we jumpstart our management by promoting some form of top kill with fire or intensive grazing. So we've came in there and we've, uh, we've reduced that above ground biomass. We've now shifted that competitive advantage from that monoculture to allow for some diversity where new plants can establish by decreasing the root mass of those dominant dominant species or grasses, and we're increasing available uh, root space and, and more light to allow those new plants to establish, basically prepping the site for more plant diversity. So we've reset the clock by shifting competitive advantages away from a monoculture um, to to allow for more, um, either more perennial native grasses or more forbs, um, basically overall more diverse plant communities. Okay, so this brings us to our third question. Number three, the ability to control brush increases with patch burning. True or false. This is taking our monoculture example that we just shared with you and applying it to brush control. Can we increase that ability? Okay, it looks like a lot of you are voting true. I was hoping to trip you up with this because oftentimes folks think that patch burn grazing is implemented at such a small scale that it really doesn't give you a foothold to get a control or handle on your brush. And that's actually false. Okay, so yes, the answer is true. We have better brush control um, because fire in those rested patches is more intense than in those pastures managed more traditionally. So we've increased those fuel loads. This was a, a picture of a prescribed burn that we implemented near Harper, Texas, and it was to control cedar. And so, as you can see in this photo, there, there wasn't a huge dense uh, density of the ash juniper or even the redberry juniper, but we were able to take a grass fire that was pretty mild in intensity and get it carried up into the canopy of that particular cedar tree. Okay, so wrapping up, patch burn grazing is the purposeful grazing, this is just that, that definition again, of a section of a landscape or pasture that has been prescribed burn, and then of course burning another section to move the grazing pressure, creating a shifting mosaic on that landscape or pasture. So for example, on, on, this, on this slide, most of your grazing livestock is in the most recently burned pasture, which is what we would expect to see and what we want to see. But as time slowly, or as time since fire slowly increases, or that new growth is consumed, some of your livestock slowly start congregating back toward the previous year's burn. And this would be the visual indicator that, hey, I think it's time to burn another portion of this pasture. 
So that's your signal to implement a new burn to attract those that grazing livestock, those grazing animals to a new area of that pasture. This is where we're shifting the pressure. So a natural rotation occurs of new burns, old burns, and non-burned mosaic pastures. Okay, so regardless of the patch burn scale, it's very important to keep in mind flexibility and adaptability and to constantly fine tune each year's plans based on those previous year results, okay? So some patch burn ponderings to keep in mind as you're thinking about this type of strategy are, is the overall burn size, Okay, species relationship with habitat structure, that vegetation structure that we talked about. Um, are you managing uh, from more of a targeted grazing perspective, maybe to get a handle on some non-desirable species? Uh, rest periods, okay, maybe you have a drought hit you right in the middle of a major burn rotation. Uh, that drought would definitely change or affect the rest periods between rotations and or the schedule of your burns. Um, and of course, different strategies to maintain the competitive advantage for those target species or to shift the, tar the competitive advantage um, from your target species. species. So, before I hand the reins over to Dr. Lyons, are there any questions? Yes, yeah, great. And we'll look at the chat box too reading while, reading we're, while we're taking these questions. Okay. Yes, yes, you bet. So, Howard asks, what? Cattle graze on burned land? What do they eat? Okay, so it's basically, um, that's a very good question, and it's basically related to what you are burning out there. Okay, so on, on one picture I showed heifers who, <laughs> who shouldn't have the know-how or the mindset to eat prickly pears since they came from uh, the McGregor Ranch in, from East Texas, but they congregated on that freshly burned pear. Um, so, so basically what, what's there, what that plant community is like prior to burning is basically going to dictate what is available to graze on. Um, and how often you turn cattle out following a burn um, depends too. You don't have to turn cattle out the second you burn something. But if you are looking to target um, non-desirable species like prickly pear or tanglehead or something like that, all of that is 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 now much more palatable um, and much more desirable to consume. So, like I said, there's lots of freedom in the type of management questions that you or the management strategies behind patch burning, but it all relates back to what you are managing for, what your objectives are. Okay, second question. How do you actually control the burn? Uh, this is from Alan. I would be afraid that I would catch my fences on fire. Good point. Uh, what are my liabilities should the fire become uncontrollable? Okay, so I'm, I'm really proud that you use control in quotations um, because that's probably the most important part of a prescribed burn. So before you implement that burn, there is a burn plan that you must follow with certain prescriptions um, that are written for you to make sure that that prescribed burn does not escape, okay? Um, so I've seen patch burn uh, grazing implemented within fire guards. Some, uh, some landowners don't like to, to make fire guards in the middle of their pasture, and that's understandable. Um, so we also can burn from natural barriers such as cedar breaks. Um, and there are lots of different fire measurements that we can take to make sure that we are within our prescription. For example, fuel moisture. We can burn during a time when, when the fuel moisture of, of grasses are high or the fuel moisture of our juniper species are high, and that in itself is going to act as a natural barrier. The fire will flat out not burn and, and something like that. So your liabilities when that fire becomes uncontrollable should be outlined in that prescribed burn plan. And that's basically going to be your Bible when you are implementing a burn. Everything needs to relate back to that burn plan. 
Um, so sh you should have a plan B um, or contingency plans in effect of where you can successfully manage that now escape prescribed burn, so major roads um, or uh, different pasture boundaries. Um, all of that should be covered in your in your burn plan. Okay, and, and on a fences note, um, you can burn out away from your fence lines. Uh, you can make sure that those are cleared, whether that's through any type of mechanical treatment. Um, there, there's, there are certain things you can implement to control um, certain trigger points. I've seen folks burn out around power pole lines because they don't want that creeping up the power pole. Um, these are all just pre pre-fire prep work that, that you need to think about before you start implementing any type of prescribed burn, um, and especially in a, in a patch burn, uh, prescribed burn as well. Okay, next question for Mike. Any health-related concerns with livestock on recently burned areas due to soot? Um, Mike, I would say basically, the biggest health concern on any type of prescribed burn um, is going to be the smoke, right, or that PM 2.5, that particle matter that everybody's talking about. Um, but I would say you definitely do not need to worry about that as it, as it relates um, to livestock. Um, now when we start talking about human health, that's, that's when, when stuff gets a little bit trickier. Um, but no, I, I'd say your, your grazing livestock, whether it's sheep or cattle or goats, um, would be just, just fine. Um, really no major health concerns um, with residual partic particulate matter in the air or soot or ash even. Okay, John asked, probably one of my favorite questions, what is a grass tiller? So a tiller is kind of the, I guess, fancy, sciencey definition of basically a grass stem. Um, so I, when, I, when I talk to folks about grass tillers, I like to, to ask them to envision a bunch grass. And there's lots of different stems coming out of that bunch grass. So each stem is basically a tiller. That's, that's what a tiller is. Okay, Diana asks, I work on South American grasslands and I am working with a NGO that would like to work on implementing burn prescriptions. What basic tools do we need to start thinking about? Um, basic tools, so probably just working with a burn plan is going to be your, your, your your most basic tool to work from. That's going to give you an idea of what type of burn you're looking to achieve, whether that's a summer burn or a, or a winter dormant burn. Um, that's going to outline your weather prescription parameters that you're going to stay within when you're implementing that burn. So we're going to talk about wind speed and wind direction and relative humidity and lots of, lots of different um, weather weather management prescriptions that should be included in that prescribed burn. Now if you're talking about tools as in like equipment, that's definitely um, a, a good question too. So typically we do a lot of our prescribed burns in, in West Central Texas with basic uh, pickup trucks and we have slip-on units or slip-in units, sprayer units that carry anywhere from 100 gallons on up to 200 gallons. And that provides not only um, water if we need it for suppression type of purposes, but it also allows us um, some to do some prep work um, potentially on fence lines or power line poles. We can put in several wet lines where fire will burn up to that wet line and then just die down. So think about uh, some slip-in units uh, for water resources. Um, definitely, if, if you know, think about contacting your, your county extension agent in that, in that area or your um, NRCS office. Those guys um, have a lot of knowledge as it relates to prescribed burning and they can Russell probably Hall, hook you up with either equipment we'll um, or some resources on, on working, on getting that equipment. So the rest of the question will be answered at the end of the seminar. Okay, sum so up, right? Thank you, Pete. 
All right. Um, what the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be talking, showing some uh, work that uh, Megan Clayton and uh, Erasmo Montemayor and I have been working on down in South Texas. And the issue it uh, revolves around tanglehead management. Uh, tanglehead is a native grass. Um, I think I have the next slide here. Yeah, it's a, a perennial bunch grass native to, to Texas. Uh, it's pretty abundant in parts of South Texas. And it, it's, it's actually a good livestock grazing grass. Uh, but it can get rank, uh, can get ahead of the cattle so that they don't, uh, comes unpreferred. Uh, and the issue down there in South Texas in these uh, sand sheets is that it's uh, where people have taken cattle off, the tanglehead becomes a problem for the wildlife in those areas. So where places have gone to all wildlife and they want to manage for quail, for example, uh, they run into problems, and I think this next slide shows some of those problems. The slide on the left, picture on the left here, uh, not as big as of a problem uh, because you've got these bunches here, but on the right here, you've got a solid mass of, t of tanglehead, and that's not a good situation for uh, for quail. So uh, we embarked on a on a study to or a applied demonstration to show that uh, patch burning could work to or to see if what we could uh, how we could use patch burning to manage this grass and uh, one question I think was how do you you know how do you control where the uh, the burn goes well, one of the ways is they're they're building these fire guards around the patches that that were going to be burned and then, of course, the other thing that you do to control things is you do it in the right conditions. Uh, the, the sizes of the patches that we were burning, and we, what we were trying to do here is, is get some intensive grazing on this tangle head. And the idea is that we would hit the grass hard uh, and then burn some other patches in another year and shift that grazing, like, like Morgan was saying, uh, to those newer patches. And so we'd have a mosaic of, of uh, freshly burned, one-year burn, two-year burn, maybe three-year burns, so that you'd have uh, different habitats for quail and for, for uh, deer or other wildlife. So uh, again, that, that uh, fire guard there that we're looking at uh, here is created with, with uh, by plowing or disking. Okay, one of the things that we did in this project, we wanted to uh, look at whether the animals, uh, what the diet, what their diet quality was. So we collected fecal samples, uh, sent them into uh, the GAN lab in Temple, and had them analyzed for crude protein and digestible organic, organic matter uh, to see if there was correlation between where they grazed and, and the diet quality. We also put uh, GPS collars on the cows. Uh, these collars were, uh, you can see, see right here, uh, that's the battery in the collar, and right here is where the computer actually is. At the top of the collar, there's an antenna, and uh, we collared uh, on, we had two ranches, four collars on each ranch. Uh, we ran the trials for about uh, 23 days, five-minute GPS fixed inter intervals. Uh, and let's see what's the next. Okay, the first ranch that we worked on is the Puesta del Sol, which is south of uh, Hebronville. And uh, this is one day prior to the burn last year. And this is uh, move this out of the way. This the burn was uh, applied on February 13th and 14. We collared the animals on the 5th, so we actually had collars on prior to the burn. And uh, you can see here uh, the green dots are where the graze, the, uh, are in the graze plots, that, or the burn plots, I'm sorry, burn plots. And the blue dots here are uh, unburned patches. And so, for example, uh, 
you, you can see this burn site here had more GPS site points in it. This burn uh, patch here had fewer. And that's kind of to be expected because we just burned it. Uh, there's really not it, not much in there for them to graze, uh, and so they don't really hang around in there. But um, let's see, for some reason, our graphs aren't showing up. Uh, there should be some there should be some graphs on these uh, in this uh, blank spot here, but they're not showing up for some reason. Basically, this uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, in, in February, there was no difference between grazed and ungrazed. In March, there was a big difference, a statistic, statistical difference between uh, burn and unburn. And you can see that here we've got a lot of GPS points in, in the burn here and here. We've got fewer points in the unburn up here at the, in the, in the kind of the northeast part of the, this picture here. And down here on the kind of southwest, so we are having an effect on attract, attracting the animals to those uh, burn sites. This is 75 days after the burn. This is an exclosure, uh, keeping the cattle out, and you can see that the grass is shorter on the outside of the, of the exclosure. Uh, so we are having having an impact on this grass around that exclosure. Uh, so here we're looking at a May trial, and in May we're still we still have a significant difference between uh, burn and unburn. You can see there's a there are a lot of GPS points inside that those are uh, inside the burn sites versus the unburn sites. So they are definitely preferring those burn sites uh, here. You know, a couple of months after after the burn. And then in July, we start to lose that effect. Uh, we still have quite a few uh, points in the Jeep, in the uh, burn areas, but the they're not the difference isn't significant statistically. Uh, but we're still putting some pressure on on that on that grass. Okay, the uh, other ranch, which is uh, kind of east of Heb Hebronville, uh, is La India Ranch. And this is uh, seven days post burn, and you can see in this exclosure here, uh, these little green specks are actually tanglehead seedlings that are starting to germinate after the burn. Uh, fire really stimulates the grass to to germinate, so that's that's one issue that I mean we're not going to get rid of the grass. We're not trying to eliminate it uh, or eradicate it. We're just trying to look at managing the grass with some. Uh, with enough grazing pressure to create that mosaic that we want for the for the wildlife. Uh, again, here in, this burn was established on March 21st, uh, and in March we didn't have a difference uh, between burn and unburn. Uh, in May we did have a difference between burn and unburn, and then we started to lose that difference uh, in July. So about you know, a couple of months is is about all the Heavy preference lasted, although they still were using those burn burn sites. Okay, so uh, historically, uh, we know that the Indians used burning to attract animals to areas, uh, improved hunting, improved uh, diet quality, and in this particular picture right here, you can see these uh, young calves are are grazing in this burned out area here. And in the background, we've got uh, some uh, little blue stem that's uh, been unburned, and they're staying out of those areas. So uh, again, it just illustrates that they will be attracted to those burned areas. And the reason is that their uh, their highest preference for food is is uh, young green growth. And so uh, you've got these grasses are starting to come back from those tillers, and uh, that there's, that's going to be young growth, and these animals are going to instinctively uh, go for that. Let's see. All right. Uh, in this study here, that they indicated that uh, both herbaceous and woody plants increase in nutritional quality following fire. And really, what's happening here is you're you're stimulating new growth. You're, for example, in the background here. If we burn that that 
uh, little blue stem there, we'd get rid of that standing dead material, that, that uh, dry material, and we would then, in that area, we'd have this young green growth, and that would be higher in quality. Uh, and that's why the, that's the reason that the nutritional quality has changed, is because you've got new growth. All right, um, and Pullendorf and Engel up in Oklahoma, they've been looking at patch burning, and they indicate from their studies that these cattle can spend 75, much 75 percent of the time in those grazing time in patches that were burned the last year. So heavy, uh, heavy attraction to those areas, and then that that attraction may even last for a couple of years. It, it's going to diminish. It may not be as intense, but it, it could last up to two years uh, post-burn. And that's one of the things we want to look at down at uh, in Hebronville area is uh, we've, we've got one trial we've done this year. We want to see what how the cattle use those, those burned areas uh, a year afterwards. Okay, and Pete, uh, I think we're, is this where we're going to switch that other slide? <laughs> Okay, uh, one of the things we did with the the uh, Hebronville Ranch studies is we looked at the ratio of GPS points uh, burned to unburned. That's on on the x-axis down here, uh, down here, and versus the crude protein prediction from the fecal analysis. And what this is telling us is that as we got more burned points than unburned points, the crude protein value increased. And so what that's saying is that those animals, it's another indication that those animals were attracted to those areas. Um, we've got the evidence from the GPS points, but the diet quality also shows that uh, when there were a lot of GPS points in those burned areas, they were getting a higher quality diet. So that's kind of the point of this slide. And this is Fullendorf's study where they, they did some burning. And in this uh, first slide here, they burned in summer of 07. Uh, and then they followed that up with a burn in the spring of, of uh, 2008. And uh, this, the, this particular trial here was following the burn in 2008. So they're still using this area that was burned in the summer of 07, as well as the 08 burn, both of those pretty heavily, and then this unburned area up here, uh, much less intensely. So that's one of the things that, that patch burning can do. It can uh, move uh, move the uh, attractiveness of, of uh, an area for you. Uh, and, and as Morgan was saying, if you rotate those burns, uh, you'll shift that that pattern of grazing, and so you'll have uh, you have less intense grazing on an area that that was previously burned, and more intense on on the more recently burned area. Okay, and so I'm at the point where there's if there's some questions that I can answer, uh, I'll try to. If not, if there are questions for uh, Dr. Russell, I'll turn it back over to her. Uh, let me see. I think Diana's first question here at the top is still from, from uh, Dr. Russell. Uh, Tom's question, I think, is for Dr. Russell. And so is Howard's and Megan. You said blue dots equal brown dots. Uh, we had, I don't know why the blue, blue dots showed up, technical difficulty or, or uh, something there. And Diana, in what instance uh, would cattle go into the unburned areas? Well, they're, uh, they're going into those unburned areas because there's still some, some plants in there that uh, they're, they're going to always search. Uh, they keep looking around. They don't, they don't necessarily uh, camp on one spot forever. So they're going to move around the pasture, and they're going to come back to those burned areas. When they don't find what they want somewhere else, they're going to and as they walk, 
they're going to eat something. Uh, they're going to have they're going to be somewhere. So uh, that's what they're doing when they show up in those un, those unburned spots. They're searching, uh, just normal searching. No, and not under extreme circumstance, just just normal circumstances. What I didn't show you all in the, in those slides was we clipped the burned and the unburned to show you the difference between those. But there were burns. I mean, I'm sorry, there were GPS points outside those areas. So uh, it, do, it doesn't give you the full picture of the pasture, but it does show, we're trying to show uh, what effect it's having on the use of those burned areas. So we think it's got a potential to manage this particular grass. Uh, and what they, what they tell us down there is that people that never took their cattle off don't have a problem with the grass which says that it's a palatable grass. Uh, so I'm going to stop and, and let Dr. Russell answer uh, those other questions that, that are left for her. OK, thanks, Dr. Lyons. So John asked, is patch burning of improved grass appropriate if you are managing for wildlife in um, Brazos County? And, and I definitely think it is. Um, I think patch burning is is a overlooked management strategy that's very beneficial to not only grazing livestock um, of all species and but also wildlife species as well. When you're creating that those differences in structure um, and increasing plant diversity, um, you're not only improving the overall plant community and the function and integrity of the site, but you're you're giving those the wildlife species and livestock species more of a selection for their diet so they can pick and choose the plants that they need to meet their needs or adequately meet their needs. Um, and, and we see that a lot just with proper grazing management. Um, but with fire, you can you can really jumpstart it and really provide them a full buffet, if you want to call it that, of, of uh, species. Well, hey, Morgan, let, let me interject yes. something there. Uh, okay. He's talking. He's talking about improved grasses, and typically in Brazos oh, okay. County, in Brazos County, they're gonna. That's gonna be a monoculture of mm. Bermuda grass or something like that. And so okay. you've already got a situation where it's not a good livestock habitat. I mean, wildlife wildlife right. habitat. So right. Uh, that would be a tough way to or tough. I mean, they tip. They typically fertilize those areas and mm -hmm. manage them for hay or manage them for grazing. Uh, so it's kind of, they're just not good grasses. There's no diversity there to begin right. with. Right, right. And so I guess it depends on if you want to keep your monoculture, you want diversity. OK. Uh, Tom asked, you didn't speak to the issue of monitoring results or methods per objective. Um, absolutely, Mo you know, monitoring after um, any type of new management is, is going to be crucial to, to tell you whether or not that, that was a success or you need to work out some, some more kinks uh, to, the, to the management. So a lot of times I see folks use photo points. Um, that's a really easy assessment to determine if your management strategy is working. Um, if you want to get really into it, you can lay some long-term type of transects and monitor uh, frequency of species or um, just overall uh, diversity. Uh, there's several diversity indices out there that you can that you can use. Um, but yes, absolutely. Monitoring is going to, to post fire and post grazing is going to be your best way to 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 see if, if what you're doing is, is truly meeting your objectives. OK. Pete, do you want to wrap up? I know we're kind of over time, or did you want me to still try to get to some of these questions? Let me go ahead and, and uh, let's go back to the, let me go ahead and just say this right quick. The, you're going to have a, a satisfactory survey pop up here in a little bit. Uh, please complete the survey, the response anonymous, and we use the information to uh, go ahead and improve our, our webinars. And the other thing is that on the next session will be June 4th, how to manage mixed brush and fence lines of pastures. Our speaker is going to be uh, James Jackson, and it'd be for 1CU IPN. And the other thing is we're putting out lots of information on our Facebook fan page. 
So if you're on Facebook, you can follow us there. Uh, and our address is there. It's facebook.com slash txrange. You can follow us there. Uh, we have another mailing list. If you're in our mailing list, if you are, are not in our mailing list, just type in your email and I will add you to our mailing list. If you don't get, if you're not getting the uh, monthly webinar announcement uh, email, just type in your email address on the chat box and I'll get them to you. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and just click over. Uh, some of y'all probably get the, the, the survey jump up in front of your screen. If you look at the task bar, you can see like an icon with two little folks. Just click on that. And you can come back to the Adobe Connect, and then uh, these folks can finish up their questions. Okay, turn it back to y'all for questions. All right, I, I see uh, Julie has a question. Has this been effective on KR Bluestem? Uh, it's no. Uh, we haven't. I don't know if anybody's really tried it on Bluestem, but but that stuff uh, really fire tends to uh, make it tends to kind of make it worse. So uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I don't. I don't know if any studies have been used to try patch burning on on the blue the KR blue stem. I know that there's some research going on in South Texas. They're looking at KR and, and Clayburg and trying to find some ways to manage it. Okay. Um, one more question Tom had. Any key di difference between a restoration of native communities versus maintenance of intact high quality, um, high quality native communities? Uh, Tom, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm assuming key differences you mean maybe productivity or above ground production um, or the the effectiveness of, of patch burning on, on something like that. Um, as a restoration tool, I don't know if if, if patch burning is, is totally going to be your answer. Um, definitely if you're looking to target some particular species in terms of control like, uh, like Dr. Lyons and Dr. Clayton's um, tanglehead work. Um, yeah, if you, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but if you want to type another clarification question, I'd, I'd sure appreciate it. So Howard also asked, any statistics concerning burns that have gotten out of control? Um, you know, prescribed burning is, is, is a very risky business. Um, definitely not going to downplay any liability or any of the risk associated with that. Um, and, and I'm not familiar with any statistics out there, you know, can't, I can't officially say one out of every 10 prescribed burn is going to turn into an escape. Um, but it's been my experience that if you have the burn plan in place and you are within your prescription, your weather prescription and your burn plan prescriptions, um, and you have solid safe fire guards and you have the people on hand and the people on deck that you need to have on hand, whether that's through water resources from volunteer fire departments or, or any other type of resources, um, your chances for having a, an escape prescribed burn are going to decrease substantially. Um, and a lot of times it's, I, I hear some folks say it's not a matter of if, but when, and, and that's just some of the risks that you take when you're, when you're taking on a prescribed burn. Um, there's a lot of advantages to prescribed burning, but there's a lot of risk associated with it too. Okay, uh, Sharon had a question about is is it this acreage dependent, stocking dependent, uh, patch burn by pasture or entire ranch? Uh, I hate to give you the answer that it depends, but uh, for example, early tanglehead work, they burned the whole pasture and they weren't getting the results that they wanted. So our thinking was that there wasn't enough pressure on the grass. So it depends on what your goals are. 
And one of the things that patch burning does is it, is it help by moving that burn around, you uh, help create that the diversity that you, that you want in a in a native situation uh, or sustain that diversity because you're you're helping to control where the animals graze. Okay, Dr. Clayton make, makes an excellent point too to uh, rest newly planted restoration sites for a couple of years to allow those plants to get some growth on them um, before you do start burning. Um, and then you can go into more of a, a maintenance mode with implementing prescribed burns. But it's very, if you are dealing with uh, freshly reseeded sites or new restoration type of sites, you do need to allow some time for those plants to establish. And I'll, I'll just I'll follow up with just a on that on that Sharon question that Sharon had. Uh, there's a ranch in South Texas that got an award one one year uh, at the Texas Section Society for Range Management, and they were managing for quail. What they would do is they would burn 25 acre patches every year, and I don't remember how many they did, but they would they would burn in 25 acre patches, and then they would graze those areas with uh, heifers, and so they would have newly burned one year, two year, three year burns. And so what they did is with that strategy, they created the mosaic that was beneficial to the quail population that they wanted to manage for. So the size that of the patch depends on what you want to accomplish. Uh, but I would say it's typically not going to be the whole pasture. I guess it would depend on how big your pasture is. but that. It's typically not, not the whole pasture. Okay, Tom, uh, maintenance versus restoration. Curious about the success of fire and the grazing metrics of intensity and stocking. Um, Bob, do you want to take that question or? Um, the season of fire and the grazing metrics of intensity of stocking. It, it basically, I, to me, I, I would just answer that with it depends and, and what you are trying to, to manage for and, um, and, and you know, whether or not you are in a maintenance type of mode or you're, you're looking to, to reclaim that, that particular site. Um, so for me, when I'm in a, in a maintenance mode type of management and I'm, I'm still looking to do a lot of prescribed burning, uh, the season of fire um, that I'm going to try to burn in is probably going to be dormant just because uh, there's a lot a lot less risk associated with dormant season or cool season type of burns. Um, typically have more stable atmospheric conditions so your wind speeds are, are fairly consistent um, and you typically have predominant winds dominating that particular area for the localized weather. Um, and RHs are, are typically a lot a lot higher too. So just overall safer burning um, burning conditions. And um, you know when you're in, when you're implementing those those maintenance type of, of fire regimes, then then it's all about just just getting the burn done and getting it done successfully. When I, I guess I'd just the only thing I'd follow up with on is it's hard to put numbers on these things because of there's yeah. there's so many. So much difference in in rainfall and all the other conditions. So it comes down to uh, monitoring and and try you know trying on a relative you know say a relatively small scale and see if that's working and if it's not you go to a different scale. Uh, but it's it's there there's, there aren't any set uh, formulas. Okay, so looks like we've got some more questions slowly dwindling in. Um, I really hope that there was some useful information out of this this webinar that that you got. Um, 
I'm really excited about the work that Dr. Clayton and Lyons are doing, and, and hopefully we can bring some of that up to the San Angelo, Edwards Plateau um, area too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clayton, uh, Dr. Russo, Dr. Lyons, and thank you folks for attending today. Looks like there are a few more questions coming up. Okay, Sharon, any problem, uh, Sharon's asked, any problems with cattle moving between the patches and erosion and to and from water? Um, so erosion definitely can occur on any post-fire site. Um, I, I would just recommend that um, the type of fire that you implement takes all of that into consideration. So um, typically cooler season, dormant season type of burns are, are less intense. Um, there's less total consumption um, in those fires, so you leave some above ground standing biomass. Um, and definitely your bunch grasses are going to leave their plant crowns intact, and that's going to provide huge amounts um, of control in terms of soil stability from wind erosion and, and, and some from water erosion as well. Um, but any problems with cattle moving between the patches? Um, I would say minimal um, problems. The, the key is just to, is to make sure that there is enough um, forage availability out there for them for them to work with um, and if they're content in that particular site then they're um, they're not going to be leaving that that site too frequently in search of, of forage um, dr. Lyons could probably answer that question a little bit better than I could but um, in terms of erosion and um, and cattle moving between the patch patches I would say very very minimal <laughs> 